Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is Sean Chamberlain, author of The Transition Timeline and the man behind DarkOptimism.org, which explores the interwoven challenges facing our global community and how we can create a joyful and resilient shared future in the face of them. Our discussion deals with the transition network and the shift to a sustainable society in response to global environmental and energy crises. Hello and welcome, Sean Chamberlain. Thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, Sean, we're here today in general to talk about the transition movement, uh, both here in the UK and and somewhat globally as well. And the, the, um, the transition movement and transition towns are basically responses to the the crisis we're facing regarding peak oil and, of course, climate change. And it's a broad-based... Um, yeah, and, and really the economic sort of crisis as well. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, who, could, who can ignore that now? And mm. it's a broad-based plan of action, the transition movement. It involves uh, awareness raising, uh, local currencies and localism generally, self-sufficiency, and, of course, in, enabling people and the places they live to, to use less energy. And in that way, turn what's basically a crisis into an opportunity for a radical rethink of how we live and based change for the better and for a sustainable future. And most of these ideas are encapsulated in a book that you wrote in 2009 called The Transition Timeline, which people can, if they're not aware of it, can get um, <clears throat> get the skinny on the whole situation there. But before we get into the issues, perhaps you could just give us a brief bio, some background on you and how you came to get involved with this work. Okay, well... Um I was basically, before before getting involved with all this stuff, I was working as the manager of a, a learning center for marginalized groups, so drug misusers and people with mental health problems and uh, particularly young asylum seekers as well. Um, and in my spare time, and this was around um, sort of 2000, 2001, um, learning about sort of peak oil and climate change in particular. And peak oil at the time was, was quite a fringe thing. I remember there was sort of one online resource which was called dieoff.org which um which is actually a technical sort of oil industry term but it sort of sums up the uh the sort of take on on the on the future of civilization that the um that the author of the website had um and so in my spare time I was learning about this stuff and I got to the point eventually where I felt you know I, I loved the work I was doing but I felt well what's the point of helping people reintegrate with society if society itself seems to be to be running off a cliff as it were um, and so in the end, I, I left that job, um, uh, learned to live very cheaply, basically, lived off my savings that I'd saved in that job for what ended up being about a year, um, spent that time sort of reading everything I could get my hands on, going along to talks and events and harassing people who seemed to know what they were talking about. Um, and then in uh, 2000, 2005, I think it was, um, went down to a residential course at a place called Schumacher College in Devon. Um, and some of the sort of teachers on that course were people like Richard Heinberg, who's been sort of one of the key educators on peak oil, um, and Rob Hopkins, who had just at that point basically just come up with the idea of, of transition towns. Um, another one I should mention is David Fleming, who became my sort of mentor in many ways, and uh, he was responsible for, for coming up with this idea of, of tradable energy quotas, which is sort of energy rationing scheme. Um, but I remember there was there was one guy, Ben Brangwin, who was a, a fellow student on the course, um, and he and I were both in a similar place. We'd sort of been been following one career path and felt, well, well no, we really want to engage with this stuff. The course was called Life After Oil, um, and we were both sort of looking for what we could do that seemed seemed sort of worthwhile and meaningful in response to it. Um, and I remember Rob Rob Hopkins coming in and sort of saying, oh, I've had this this crazy idea, transition towns, and uh, we've just sort of just started doing some stuff about it here in Totnes and um, you know do you, do you think it's an idea that can go somewhere and I think there were about about 28 of us I think on the on the course and we were all sort of yeah this sounds sounds really exciting and I remember Ben and I who really really clicked sort of in the first week of the course um, looking at each other and going wow this guy's really got something and uh, and Ben put his hand up and he said uh, Rob if you had I think he said something like if you had if you had a hundred grand to really sort of ramp up this transition idea and do something with it, what, what what would you do? And Rob sort of looked back at him all sly and said, why, have you got 100 grand you're looking to, to put into something? And then said, well, no, but, you know, I think I could raise it with an idea like this. And um, and the two of them then went off into a corner and ended up starting the Transition Network, which is uh, the charity which, um, which sort of supports transition initiatives around the world in various ways. 
Um, and so uh, I was sort of in in on the ground floor, if you like, on, on, on transition sort of taking off. And then my book emerged later when um, a lot of the the individual transition communities were trying to produce what we call uh, energy descent action plans, which is essentially a community looking at um, where they're at now and where they what what they dream their community to look like in 20 years, um, given an understanding of of climate change and of peak oil and of of economic crisis. Um, what would we what would we love Kingston, for example, where I'm based, to look like in say 2032? And a lot of the communities were trying to do this, but they were struggling because they knew about their their local their local needs and their local resources and their local skills, but they didn't know so much about um, the non-local things that were going to affect them. So from from things like climate change and peak oil and how those are going to develop, but also sort of UK government policy decisions and you know these larger scale issues that were going to affect the local scale. And so a lot of them were were sort of phoning up Transition Network and saying, well, how do we how do we do this energy descent action plan without that? Um, and so uh, Rob or Ben from Transition Network sort of phoned me up and asked if I'd like to do a, a piece of work sort of um, scoping out some of these issues and, and doing some sort of future scenario planning around the different ways that, um, that the next 20 years could pan out. Um, and what over the sort of couple of years that I spent working on the project that eventually became the book, um, one of the things that really emerged from that was this notion of um, cultural stories. And I, I know you did a couple of interviews with John Michael Greer on this show, um, and he's someone who was was very influential on me in terms of um, in terms of developing that idea. And um, really, it's the notion that we we make sense of the world through stories. I mean, we um, we tell our we tell our children stories in order to sort of raise them and educate them. And politicians tell us stories and narratives in terms of you know how wonderful life will be if they're elected, or how terrible it will be in terms of someone else elected. And these stories really shape the, the, the day-to-day decisions that we make. And as I was looking at the sort of future scenarios, for, um, primarily for the UK, but also the world, it seemed like there were three um, dominant narratives that really um, that shape our culture and the way that we respond. Um, and I think probably that exist in all of us. Um, and so one of those is this um, sort of business as usual, you know, this kind of attitude. Nothing, nothing really changes that dramatically, and tomorrow will look basically like today, and we just sort of plod along. And, and you see that, for example, in government policy documents where they say, well, here's the trend over the last 20 years, and so we'll just continue that line on for the next 20 years, and we'll plan on that basis. Um, and another really powerful story in our culture is, is the sort of doom story, if you like, a sort of apocalyptic vision of the future that, you know, ultimately we're going to get our comeuppance or, you know, religious apocalypse or, um, or you know, Terminator or whatever. And we see, we see this kind of um, vision of the future all over our, our sort of culture and in our films and books. And, and it's definitely something that we all sort of have inside us from our, from our sort of cultural upbringing. Um, and I think the third sort of dominant narrative is, um, is this notion of sort of what you might call a techno-utopia, um, a sort of Star Trek type vision where, you know, this human ingenuity has, has led us up onwards and upwards to this, you know, current pinnacle that society's never been more advanced than it is today, definitely tied in with sort of technological process and, and, and human brilliance. And that, you know, our, our manifest destiny is to is to have this sort of idealized future among the stars and, and explore the nature of reality. And, and all three of these these sort of narratives about the future I think are in all of us, and we all probably, depending on our mood, shift from uh, from sort of feeling that one or the other of those is um, is the likely future every day, probably, and and we respond on the basis of those expectations, and we shape our future on the basis of those expectations. Um, and one of the things that we really wanted to do with uh, with the transition timeline book was to try and um, make real a fourth narrative. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's it's very easy looking at those three dominant narratives to see why the, the sort of techno utopia vision is, is a much more appealing vision than the other two, um, and so it's very easy to see why people subscribe to that. 
Um, but as, as other of your guests have said, um, the, the facts don't really bear it out. I mean, if you try and actually justify the notion that this is the most advanced civilization has ever been, it's, it's quite hard to do that. You know, we've got, we've got high rates of, of mental health and depression and we're destroying our global environment at an unprecedented rate and, and we're not, we're not really moving the, the, um, there's this lovely, um, Chinese proverb, uh, if you don't change direction, you are likely to end up where you're headed. And um, at the moment, where we're headed on the current trajectory is, uh, if we if we look with an unbiased eye at the at the scientific evidence, not looking too wonderful. No, I think that. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I think oh, that where things are headed hmm. is basically negating the possibility of either business as usual or the techno utopia. I think exactly. that we can see things in decline now across a wide range of fronts, you know, man-made and natural. So business and as usual is already being disrupted. That's not going to happen. And all the talk at the minute amongst politicians and economists and um, their ilk is getting back to business as usual as quickly as possible. But it's manifestly not going to happen. The techno future was supposed to be here 10 years ago. <laughs> I talked about that with, with John Michael Greer, and he, he's very witty in his writing about sort of yeah. debunking that. Uh, that. You know, that should have arrived. Uh, it's not going to happen for all sorts of reasons we can go into. I think mm -hmm. that collapse is still a possibility, but yeah. if I was going to bet on either collapse or some kind of gradual step-down process transition to a different type of society, then it's the latter I'd definitely put my money on. Right, but in, in a, there's one very interesting thing about stories, um, particularly about these sort of cultural stories about the future, which is that um, there's a difference between our story of the future and our, our prediction of the future. So, for example, um, if you if you hold to a sort of apocalyptic vision, you know, oh, we're all doomed and we're, you know, humanity is going to be extinct within 50 years or whatever, then um, that seems a lot bleaker than a kind of business as usual perspective. But it might actually lead to a slightly better future because at least you might make some kind of preparations on that basis. You might actually think, well, if things are going to be that bad, I'm going to try and, you know, secure a reliable food supply for, for myself or my community or whatever, whereas the business as usual believer um, might actually lead themselves into a, into, a, into a bleaker actual future because they won't in any way prepare. And so there's a distinction between the, the sort of future we expect, the future that we buy into, and the future that we're creating by buying into that. Um, and that's why, as, as you sort of uh, touched on there, we tried to, to flesh out what we call the sort of transition vision of the future, although it's, it's gone by many other names, of course, um, which is a sort of, it's a positive, um, it's a positive vision of the future to sort of set alongside that techno-utopia. But crucially, it's, it's also trying to be a realistic one, one that actually, actually takes into account sort of um, where we are and where, where we appear to be heading. Yeah, and I think it's very important to offer people uh, a vision, whether it's... Um you know, a technical, detailed, this is how it can be done uh, plan, or whether it's a, you know, a feeling about, you know, that it could be better. We, you know, we, we can't maybe right now count the ways in which it would be better, but we know that a lot of what we're doing now isn't working, so we need to change it. Yeah. So across the board, offering that to people, it's, it's basically the metaphorical light at the end of the tunnel, really. Well, hopefully, certainly. I mean, the um, the approach we sort of took in the book after laying out these these sort of four stories and where where they'd be likely to lead if they if they sort of shape our our, our politics and our cultural response was to look at each of um, well some of the critical areas um, in society. So looking at food and water, looking at electricity and energy, looking at healthcare, looking at all these different areas, and for each of those, um, laying out the the facts on you know what's happened up to this point and the trends and where they seem to be leaving, leading, sorry. Um, but also then laying out what we call the sort of cultural story change that could exist around, um, around each, of those, um, each of those things. So, for example, looking at population and demographics, um, sort of laying out the facts on that and, you know, the, the incredible explosion of, of human numbers that we've seen globally over the last few hundred years. And how actually that's often presented as a as a great triumph, you know, as human ingenuity and progress. And I often remember um, an episode of The Simpsons in which uh, they the sort of trial on the on the TV of an upcoming program called Man versus Nature: The Road to Victory. 
and um, and that sort of sums up beautifully the kind of um, the cultural story that's there is that you know we're we're overcoming nature and, and showing that humanity is dominant when in fact um, as any ecologist will tell you we're we're part of a web of life and that actually one um, one life form taking up so much of the um, of the energy input of the earth essentially. Um, actually means that that web is, is is in a huge imbalance and 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 under under great stress and of course we're seeing this this great mass extinction at the moment that, that's taking place globally um, and that actually you know we are massively interdependent with the rest of nature I mean that's where our our food and our water and our oxygen for starters come from. Well, this is essentially um, um, James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis, which however much any individual wants to buy into that, it's clear that if we change our perspective and see ourselves as part of this holistic system um, then well everything changes that new perspective sh shows us the, you know the limits to uh, what we're doing on you know what we can do and, and the problems created by what we have done and it points a very clear way forward is which the the system must uh, get into equilibrium with itself you know what goes in uh, well, sorry, what we take out of it must be put back in some form or other. That's how you know the Earth has existed for billions of years up until relatively recently.